Okay. So then what I would like to go into just a little bit here in the time that we have left, um, because I heard a lot of question about strategies, and I heard a lot of uh, reference to kids with challenging behaviors and wanting ideas. So I'd like to talk just a little bit about some specific ideas and strategies. And, and a fair number of these are targeted for the younger crowd that some of what we talked about this morning was not as targeted for. So this might have more applicability for some of you that work with, with younger kids. Okay. So our goal when we talk about working with students with challenging behaviors is um, we want to try to prevent problem behaviors before they start wherever possible, right? Um, we want to put as much energy as we can into the structure um, and preventative measures so that we're not just reacting always to problem behaviors, we're preventing them. When problem behaviors occur, we want to be able to evaluate them, and we want to evaluate them in a way that allows us to come up with usable, effective interventions. When we talk about pre preventing problem behaviors from occurring, these are kind of structural things a lot of times, right? They're, they're having good classroom rules. What makes a good classroom rule? Consistent, what else? Reasonable. Reasonable, what else? Positive. Enforceable, positive, specific enough that you'll know it when you see it, right? You can respond more effectively if you know if that's a rule violation or, or in accordance with the rules. Um, managing transitions well also prevents an awful lot of problem behaviors. Um, and if there was only one thing if I had five minutes with any family of a child who has problem behaviors and I could only teach them one thing, it would be this one. Using your attention strategically. And that's true not only for parents of kids with problem behaviors, but staff. One of the things that Anitra and I do um, is we work with Head Start. We provide mental health consultation to Head Start programs around the panhandle. Not all of them, but some of them. And we are required to go in and do what are called general mental health observations, which is where we go in and we observe the site and we comment on structure and consistency and discipline and all those wonderful things and we make suggestions. And then when they have a student who has problem behaviors, we do what are called specific mental health observations, where we go in and we do a structured observation of that student in particular um, and do the same thing, right? We make uh, comments about what we think is the function of the behavior and what's driving it and suggestions about what to do. Did one of these recently. <clears throat> and I was there probably, a, a child with high, high frequency problem behaviors, aggression, running off, non-compliance, disruptive, high frequency behaviors. And I was there for 35 minutes before I observed any staff attending to him in any positive way. Right? Um, and, 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 and that's not to be harsh on that staff because this is the reality of our life as adults for our own kids and for the kids we teach. If kids are doing what they're supposed to be doing, we can do the other 12 things we're supposed to be doing, right? If we're at home and our kids are behaving themselves, we can do the dishes and we can cook a meal and we can put away something and we can whatever. But as soon as Evan smacks Ivy, boom, they've got my attention, right? So, so kids' lives, for the most part, inside and outside of the classroom, are set up that they tend to get more attention for doing the wrong thing than they do for doing the right thing. And for many kids, they seem to do okay despite that, right? But for kids who have problem behaviors, they don't. So this little guy, I literally would observe him sitting appropriately in his cubby, as they all were, waiting to go to the next thing. And he would sit there being appropriate for a fairly long stretch of time. And he was receiving absolutely no attention or interaction of any kind for it. And pretty soon I could literally see it happen. And he would get up and he would go pinch a neighbor or he would poke somebody or he would do something and boom, he'd access that attention. It fed the need. So he would be redirected back to his little cubby and he would sit there appropriately for a while longer and he would get absolutely no attention for doing so and pretty soon he would get up and he would twirl madly around the room willy-nilly and he would get redirected and get a little bit of verbal attention and so on it went for 35 minutes before somebody happened to say oh good job at whatever 
and it gave him a little bit of positive dose, but by then it was too late. And so then, when I was able to make that comment and that observation to the staff in a very nice way, um, and they switched things around, and they did, but it was too late, and he was already too far gone, and so how high they had to raise the bar in order to compete with the negative attention he was already getting, it was too high. They couldn't do it. And, and so, differential attention is, is possibly the single biggest tool that I would urge you to look at. And it's not just true for preschoolers. I've been in multiple, multiple classrooms, middle school even, where a child with behavior problems um, might have a paraprofessional assistance. And one of the issues is uh, work completion. And so they'll have a very nice program to motivate greater work completion. And all sorts of really nice things will happen when he completes a page of work. And so I would say, well, how often does he complete a page of work? Well, maybe once a day. We're lucky if it's a good day. Okay, so meanwhile, as I'm observing there for a couple of hours, I see like 71 instances of redirection or correctional attention happening. So this kiddo is no dummy. He can either get one instance of positive attention or 71 incidences of negative or corrective attention. That's a no-brainer right there. And for kids, and especially kids with problem behaviors, they don't particularly care what version the attention comes in, right? Okay. So um, when we're talking about the structural things, oh, and this is the other thing about transitions. Um, the transitions often, when I observe classrooms of particularly young children, especially if there are a lot of kids in the classroom who have problem behaviors, the transitions are way too long. And kids with problem behaviors get lost in long transitions. Transitions need to go quickly and they need to be structured in a way that supports movement from one activity to another, give advance warning of transitions coming up, and have preferably some sort of visual guide to guide the students to the next activity. 